Greetings, and welcome to this webinar, Being a Eucharistic People in Digital Space, Liturgy in the Time of COVID. My name is Jason Welly, and I'm the Director of Studies at the Pontifical Institute for Arabic and Islamic Studies in Rome, as well as a member of the Steering Committee for the Ecclesiological Investigations International Research Network. The global COVID-19 pandemic has had major ramifications for how human beings gather for worship throughout the world. The impact has been especially pronounced among sacramental communions for whom the Eucharist is the central act of worship. How are churches and communions responding? What ecclesiological insights undergird these responses? And what are some of the grassroots implications for these various traditions? This webinar will respond to those questions, featuring ecclesiologists from Roman Catholic, Pentecostal, Protestant, and Orthodox Christian traditions. The detailed schedule has been posted online, which consists of three separate panels. The first addressing theological considerations for the questions at hand, the second addressing grassroots initiatives emerging from the pandemic, and the third considering other liturgical initiatives in digital worship. Each panel will include time for questions and answers, and we encourage participants to submit their questions using the Q&A box. The webinar will conclude with some synthetic reflections asking where Christians go from here as we look forward to post-pandemic worship. The Ecclesiological Investigations International Research Network was founded by the late Gerard Mannion in 2005, seeking to promote studies, research, dialogue, and collaboration in ecclesiology across the broad spectrum of the Christian tradition. An abiding principle of the network is that the church must be inclusive in order to remain relevant in the world. And the network, through a series of international conferences, through regular panels uh, to major scholarly organizations, and through research projects and publications, serves as an inclusive hub to facilitate conversation and collaboration between scholars of different traditions. You can learn more about the network and our future events at our website, ei-research.net, ei found in the chat box. This webinar is co-sponsored and hosted by Georgetown University's Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs. This webinar is being recorded and a captioned video will be archived on the Berkeley Center's website. All who registered will receive an email with a link to the recording when it becomes available. We are also grateful for the co-sponsorship of the Department of Theology and Religious Studies at Georgetown University, as well as the North American Academy of Ecumenists. Our first speaker is Dr. Peter Fahn, who holds the Ignazio Alla Curia Chair of Catholic Social Thought at Georgetown University. He is the author or editor of over 30 books and has published over 300 essays on a wide variety of topics related to Christian theology and interreligious dialogue. His writings have been translated into at least 13 other languages, and among all our learned panelists, I suspect he requires the least introduction. Immediately following Dr. Fahn's comments, our first panel concentrates on the theological question, what constitutes a Eucharistic assembly? And the panel begins with the Reverend Dr. Emilio Alvarez, the presiding bishop of the Union of Charismatic Orthodox Churches. He holds a PhD from Fordham University and is currently pursuing his second doctorate at the University of Aberdeen. Bishop Alvarez will be followed by the Reverend Dr. Elizabeth Anderson, the president of the North American Academy of Ecumenists. She is an assistant professor of theology and religious studies at the College of St. Scholastica in Duluth, Minnesota. Her research focuses primarily on Middle Eastern Christianity and on Muslim Christian dialogue. I remind you again that you may submit questions at any time using the Q&A, preferably indicating whether the question is directed to a specific panelist or to the whole panel. Without further ado, let us move to Peter Fahn with his talk entitled, Setting the Context, the Liturgy, Worship, and the Global Pandemic. Thank you very much, Jason, for the introduction. And uh, hello to everybody who is joining this webinar. I've been asked to talk no more than 10 minutes to lay down the theological background or setting to understand the issues of Eucharistic celebration during the COVID-19 pandemic. Among the myriad challenges the COVID-19 pandemic has posed to our world, one that deeply worries religious leaders, 
is whether and how public worship or liturgy, which is the lifeblood of faith, can be practiced without a community gathered around in a common worship space. Obligatory quarantine and only the assembly of a very small number of the faithful being permitted with strict social distancing and mask wearing guidelines obviously make the regular liturgical celebration much diminished, if not impossible. This is cause for deep concern for all religious leaders, but especially for the Christian leaders whose churches have the Eucharistic liturgy. Why the lack of a full assembly for Sunday religious services arguably has less or but real impact on the churches that have only the liturgy of the word, it has devastating effects for those that have weekly Sunday Eucharist, such as the Catholic, Orthodox and Anglican churches, and to a lesser degree, the churches of the Reformation. Before approaching the theme of sacramental, especially Eucharistic celebration in the time of the COVID-19 pandemic, let us note a few things. First, the current pandemic is not the first time that the church is confronted with the issue of celebrating the Eucharist without the physical presence of the assembly due to the threat of extremely contagious and fatal viruses. It would be instructed to know how the sacraments, especially the Eucharist, were celebrated during past pandemics. There is no need to go back as far as the bubonic plague in the 14th century when prevention and medical treatment were scarcely available. The pandemics in the 20th century, such as the so-called Spanish flu of 1918, the 2003 SARS, the 2009 swine flu, the 2014 Ebola, and the 2015 Zika have forced the churches to either cancel Sunday worship or to hold it in the open air when church buildings were ordered to close. Secondly, remote participation in the Eucharist, at least for the Catholic Church, is not new. Two cases come to mind. First, mass for shut ins, such as the sick and the physically handicapped, has long been made possible, especially after television was widely available. The other is Sunday celebration in the absence of a priest due to priestly shortage, for which there is an official handbook with detailed instructions on who can do what. In both cases, the reception of the previously consecrated host, normally brought by a deacon or a Eucharistic minister, is the high point. Thirdly, thanks to widespread vaccination, it is highly likely that soon the celebration of Eucharist with the in-person congregation is possible again. In light of these developments, I would like to highlight some of the theological challenges as well as opportunities raised by the COVID-19 pandemic for the Eucharistic celebration, the theme of our webinar today. The churches have not been, of course, remiss in devising ways to celebrate Sunday worship safely and meaningfully without a physical assembly. And there has been no shortage of writings by theologians as well as liturgists during the last year on whether and to what extent live stream TV masses and attendance at them through Zoom, either simultaneously or asynchronously embody the full meaning of the Eucharistic celebration. Innumerable Christian websites have offered a plethora of practical suggestions on how to lead the Christian life during the pandemic. For example, crosswork.com has offered 25 creative ideas for Christian ministry during the COVID-19 
As helpful as these ideas and suggestions are, they are mostly limited to practical theology and have failed to deal with the fundamental issues of systematic theology raised by both the pandemic and the digital age and space in which the church inescapably exists today. As a result, there is an almost irresistible temptation to return to the pre-pandemic theology and practice of the Eucharist as if the pandemic was simply an unfortunate hiatus that will shortly be overcome thanks to the near universal vaccination. I will cluster the theological issues around four topics, ecclesiology, pneumatology, Christology, and Eucharistic theology. First, what does the COVID-19 pandemic reveal about what the church is? Avery Dulles, six models of church are well known, namely the church as an institution, mystical communion, sacrament, herald, servant, and discipleship. Of course, not all models equally express the nature of the church. The pandemic has shown the limitations of the church as an institution, its hierarchical structure, and even the physical church buildings as sacred space. It has been said in jest, or the orbit without a grain of truth, that Vatican II's most significant reform consists in showing that the dioceses could function well, perhaps even better, when the bishops were away in Rome for months on end. During the pandemic, the role of the ordained male priest presiding at the Eucharist was drastically reduced even when the mass is live streamed. Furthermore, the participant can, with the click of the mouse, turn off the priest's bad and boring homily, rather than being a captive audience, or they may shop around for online mass with the best homilies. Furthermore, the church as mystical communion is enhanced, not diminished, enhanced. When through Zoom, it is no longer limited to a particular parish with a canonically demarcated territory, but can truly be universal in scope. Church as herald becomes real for the laity when they are no longer mere listeners to summon delivered by a priest to an audience, usually of 700 parishioners whose real life concerns are rarely addressed. The word proclaim and preach remains remote and irrelevant. When, however, during the quarantine, the father or mother has to read the scripture text of the day, talk about the immediate implication for their family, and dialogue with their children on how to lead the biblical message in the coming week. However, as the role of the hierarchical priesthood wanes significantly at the Eucharist during the pandemic, and as the laity, especially women, assume greater responsibility in proclaiming and interpreting the word, and in some cases presiding at the Eucharist, a new pneumatology with a strong emphasis on baptismal charisms and spiritual powers must be elaborated, drawing from the theological resources of the three churches mentioned above to validate and strengthen this new undeniable underground ecclesial, ecclesial uh, reality. Thirdly, a new nematology necessarily calls for a new Christology. Who is Jesus the Christ? For the sick and the dying because of COVID-19 and their survival families. The liturgy, says Vatican II, is, quote, an exercise of the priestly office of Jesus Christ, unquote. But if the priesthood of Christ, a Jewish male, 
is wielded by the authorities of some churches as an argument to restrict it to males only, while during the pandemic, women as members of the body of Christ perform public worship. Which other aspects and roles of Jesus should be given priority during the pandemic? In the gospel, Jesus is depicted, depicted as a healer of both physical and spiritual illnesses. In the COVID-19 pandemic, the majority of healers and caretakers are female doctors and especially nurses. They it is, and not the male priests that embody most powerfully the reality of Jesus as the healer. In the gospel, Jesus is depicted, depicted as a healer of both physical and spiritual illnesses. In the COVID-19 pandemic, the majority of healers and caretakers are doc female doctors and especially nurses. They it is, and not the male priests, that embody most powerfully the reality of Jesus the healer. And therefore, a Christology should be elaborated in which Jesus' priesthood is understood to be exercised not only in its sacrificial, but also in its medicinal sense. Fourthly, who is present in the Eucharist? Vatican II subject, speak of the fourfold presence of Jesus in the Eucharist, namely in the word, in the priest, in the assembly, and most of all in the Eucharistic bread and wine. The council gives great emphasis on the presence of Christ in the consecrated bread and wine. Catholic theology referred to it as, quote, real presence, unquote. This expression is rather misleading as if the other three presences are somehow not real or less real. Christ is truly and really present in all the four components of the Eucharist. Unfortunately, traditionally emphasis has been laid on Christ's presence on the consecrated elements and the priest. The pandemic vividly reminds us of the real presence of Christ in the world and in the women, men and children who gather around the kitchen table or the living room to hear God's word and give thanks to God for the strength given them to endure the illnesses and death of their loved ones and all the victims of COVID around the world. When they share bread and wine with one another after the recital of the narrative of the Last Supper, they do share with one another the body and blood of Christ, who is made present by invoking the Holy Spirit to be sent upon their bodies and on the bread and wine and transubstantiating them into Christ's body and blood. Even after the pandemic is over and Sunday masses can be celebrated with the congregation physically present again, let us not rush back to the old ways of Eucharistic celebration. During the pandemic, we have entered and live in a new digital space. This new digital sacred space is made possible not by choice but by necessity thanks to the new digital age. The church and the Eucharist in the, in the digital, digital age are not quote virtually but really present and real. But this new reality can be a blessing only if we rethink theologically what the church is, what the spirit does, how Christ is the healer, and the many four ways Christ is present in the assembly. Thank you very much. To uh, uh, our colleague and uh, dearest senior statesman, uh, Dr. Peter Fahn, we thank you for such a wonderful uh, foundational setting for our conversation um, in regards to what constitutes a Eucharistic assembly during COVID-19, your remarks and your reflection are of much merit. Uh, 
Uh, I greet all of my colleagues and my friends um, in the name of Christ, our Lord, of course. Uh, I am here to bring you my short reflection uh, entitled, Just Say the Word, a Pentecostal Eucharistic Epiclesis in the Time of COVID-19. For segments of Pentecostalism, recovering the theology and practice of sacramental worship, Worship in the time of COVID-19 not only saw us forced back into our homes, the original Eucharistic assembly, but it also caused us to revisit our understanding of what it means for the word to come under our roof. While other sacramental communities recovered and promoted the practice of spiritual communion, Pentecostals recovering the great tradition, utilizing the centurion servant narrative of Matthew 8 in conjunction with the work of Teresa Berger regarding digitally mediated sacred space, expanded upon the concept of what constitutes a Eucharistic assembly to include an epiclesis said by a duly ordained celebrant at a particular location, yet able to extend itself outside of the four walls of the church into the homes of believers. In his monumental work, uh, The Eucharist, Sacrament of the Kingdom, Father Alexander Schmemann speaks of assembling as the first liturgical act of the Eucharist. This assembly, or the synaxis, is a coming together of believers for the sole purpose of worshiping, in the words of uh, Father John Baer, the crucified and resurrected one, who is proclaimed as gospel in accordance with the scriptures, is encountered in the breaking of bread, and I would like to add an experience in the life of the spirit. The Eucharist stands as the center of this worship assembly, our action of assembly itself being validated by the words of Jesus in John chapter 6, where he says, for my flesh is food indeed and my blood is drink indeed. Yet this proclamation serves a dual purpose. It serves not only the purpose of validating part of the teaching of real presence, as Dr. Peter Fahn has suggested and reminded us, but it also validates our coming together to eat of it. Of well, the very few times uh, of assembly in the ancient world, one of them was over food and drink. Therefore, if his flesh and blood are indeed food and drink, then we can indeed assemble to eat it. The same teaching is echoed in Paul's Eucharistic admonishment in 1 Corinthians 11, it is found in the Didache's call to the faithful to come together. It is spoken of in Justin Martyr's apology. And today, it is maintained throughout the church, one holy, Catholic, and apostolic. However, the COVID-19 pandemic, along with its health and safety concerns, have brought about physical restrictions, which have not only challenged the historical and theological notions of what constitutes a Eucharistic assembly, as described above, but it is also called for a distinctive response from Pentecostal sacramental communities. After some reflecting on the question at hand, and after having led a Pentecostal charismatic sacramental community through the ramifications of COVID-19 restrictions, I would like to offer the following three-point reflective response. First, I will argue that in somewhat of a contrast to Schmemann, that what constitutes a Eucharistic assembly is first and foremost an agreement among believers and that assembly is a consequence of agreement and not vice versa. Second, that after agreement and assembly must come active participation of persons in worship, but that this participation during physical restrictions of a pandemic can be bridged by digitally mediated sacred space as real space, yet even more indispensable than this I will argue, is the active participation of the Holy Spirit, who is not bound by physical or spatial limitations, and as such is able during times when we are unable to uh, physically gather, reach our homes. Lastly, that if the person of the Holy Spirit in the epiclesis is not bound by physical limitations, then an epiclesis prayed by a duly ordained celebrant at a Eucharistic celebration at a certain location, can indeed reach active participants watching in their homes via digitally mediated sacred space. And thus, that constitutes a Eucharistic assembly, and that Eucharist can be called valid. To my first point, and possibly the one 
that encompasses most of this current reflection. A focus on and a close reading of St. Cyprian's On Church Unity reveals that in writing against the Novation Schism, he takes issue with their interpretation and utilization of Matthew 18, 20, where there are two or three gathered in his name, he is there. They use this to validate their assembly. But possibly with Amos 3, 3 in mind, uh, Cyprian argues that in so doing, the followers of Novation quote the last words, but they lay aside the former words. The preceding 19th verse, which states, again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my father in heaven. For Cyprian, the correct ordered reading of these verses shows that God places the emphasis, and I quote, not to the multitude, but to the unanimity or the agreement of those who pray. If he says two of you shall agree on earth, he placed agreement first, end quote. For our reflective conversation, a contextualization of Cyprian's thinking reveals that the synaxis, the assembly, must therefore be predicated first and foremost upon an agreement. Here, this assembly becomes the consequence of an agreement and not the other way around. The question for our context becomes, if we are prohibited to assemble because of a pandemic, does that mean that we no longer agree? The answer to the question from the various sociological, religious examples would be a resounding no. With COVID-19 restrictions in place, we've seen that e-commerce, for example, has been embraced for all manners of goods and services, books, travels, groceries, electronics, cars, and even homes to be sold and provided for via online, all based upon an agreement absent of an actual assembly. In like manner, the lack of religious assembly during physical restrictions have no consequence on our religious or faith agreements, particularly, though, particularly for those of us from sacramental communities. Because we cannot assemble does not mean that we cease to believe or agree in Christ's real body and real blood present at the Eucharist. Secondly, if assembly as the first liturgical act of the Eucharist is the consequence of agreement, which is not confined by physical spatial limitations, then how do we address the issue of non-physical active participation in worship? Alluded to by Dr. Peter Fahn. Can digitally mediated space be considered both sacred and actively, uh, actively participatory? For Teresa Berger, any misgivings concerning digital worship are usually rooted in the assumptions that I quote, that being at worship amounts to a disembodied virtual and therefore unreal practice. She goes on, however, to argue that, and I quote, digitally mediated liturgical practices are material practices, as are all offline liturgies. In the case of digitally mediated worship, this material practice is enabled foundationally by the interfaith, uh, uh, the interface, excuse me, of a human body with a computer or other internet accessing device. Digitally mediated practices of prayer and worship thus cannot be separated either from a physical body or from materiality, end quote. Believers at home, in short, engaged in worship through digitally mediated sacred space are then indeed active in participation of worship. Today, due to COVID-19 restrictions, this active digitally mediated participation by the faithful is being recovered mainly through the historic practice of spiritual communion in the more Western Christian traditions, Roman Catholic, Anglican, Methodist, and so on. Spiritual communion as the act of desiring union with Jesus in the Holy Sacrament used to prepare oneself for mass by the faithful who can't actually receive the Eucharist has been a teaching promoted by venerable saints, such as St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, Teresa of Avila, and most recently it has been encouraged by Pope Francis himself. Peter J. Casarella, in speaking of the foundational liturgical reforms found in Pope Pius, Pius XII's papal encyclical Mediator, Mediator Day, Day, excuse me, 
which leads to a theology of active participation in spiritual communion, suggests, and I quote, that theocentric vision of the liturgically minded concept of active participation demands both exterior and interior worship that are fostered, but the chief element of divine worship must be interior, end quote. This type of divine interior worship in the heart of the believer promotes an encounter with Christ, a theocentric vision of worship, which allows for the principles of active participation and popular devotion, particularly experienced in the teaching of spiritual communion, but also in Eucharistic adoration. Spiritual communion during COVID-19 has been observed practically within some of the traditions already mentioned above, by way of mass through digitally mediated sacred space inclusive of, the wor inclusive of the words of institution said by a duly ordained celebrant in a digital article written for the Catholic News Service, the author Chaz Muth depicts some of the various ways in which spiritual communion observed through digitally mediated sacred space has impacted the life of believers with one person stating, and I quote, spiritual communion is real. If we can believe in the spirit being within the Eucharist, then we can believe in the spirit of communion coming to us through our hearts when we go to a virtual mass, no matter how shaky and distracted it appears on the screen. While some Western traditions during COVID-19 have recovered the, this concept of active participation through the teaching of spiritual communion, Pentecostals recovering the great tradition have embraced a more Eastern understanding of the sacrament. For this segment of Pentecostalism, the primary question at hand is not whether there can be digitally mediated active participation on the part of the believer. This is already settled with the notion of agreement. But the even more pressing question is whether the Holy Spirit himself can be actively participating beyond interior movements of the heart in a Eucharist celebrated through digitally mediated sacred space and if so, how? If agreement between believers concerning real presence in the Eucharist is present in the absence of being able to assemble, an active participation through digitally mediated space on behalf of the believer is present, can it then be concluded that the real church is present via digitally mediated sacred space? And if the church is present, then can it also be concluded that the Holy Spirit is present as well? As Irenaeus reminds us of such a reality in book three of his refutation and overthrow of knowledge, falsely so-called, when he states, for where the church is, there is the spirit of God. And where the spirit of God is, there is the church and every kind of grace, end quote. This grace is the same grace which for Paul, according to 2 Corinthians 13, comes through our Lord Jesus Christ as reflective of the love of God the Father and is obtained in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, if we agree that the Holy Spirit actively participates in a digitally mediated worship, and so is every kind of grace present, the question becomes, can this grace, through his presence, during physical restrictions be limited to the interior working of the heart, or could it also be actively present in an epiclesis over bread and wine located in diverse locations of believers who are in agreement with one another via digitally mediated sacred space? Put in a more practical manner, is it possible for us to believe that when we receive the papal blessing, ubi et orbi, to the city and the world, given at a particular place, that it can be received by countless believers around the world, but subsequently cannot believe that the same spirit who carries and who is the blessing itself can be actively working and received in bread and wine reserved in various locations around the world via digitally mediated sacred space. Numerous are the biblical instances which depict the Holy Spirit's ability to transcend beyond more uh, mere intentional spatial limitations. From the two men that stayed in the camp, and yet the Spirit fell on them, and they prophesied in Numbers 11, to the man in the Gospels of Luke and Mark casting out devils in Jesus' name without being a disciple of Jesus. It has been clear, once again, that agreement in the absence of assembly constitutes active participation on the part of the believers and the spirit, which can, 
at least in the spirit's case, go beyond spatial limitations. Perhaps the greatest example of such thinking and the one which Pentecostals recovering the great tradition lean on the most is the centurion servant narrative found in the gospel of Matthew and Luke. Here, the centurion who asked Jesus to heal his servant is able to connect the authority of Jesus's word with his own authority to command other soldiers and thus states, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only speak the word and my servant will be healed. Matthew tells us that Jesus being amazed by the centurion's faith responds, go, let it be done for you according to your faith and that the servant was healed in that very hour. For Pentecostals recovering the theology and practice of the Eucharist during COVID-19 restriction, the word has power. Not only the power to touch the hearts of the faithful, but as the biblical narratives demonstrate above, the power which causes exterior physiological and material changes as well. This type of power in connection to the word is the one referred to by Gregory of Nyssa in chapter two of his great catechism, when he contrasts the spoken word, which is carried by the natural man's breath with the word Christ and the breath Holy Spirit, which proceeds from God the Father. Gregory's thinking can advertently be situated within the centurion servant narrative as a mode of reflecting upon what occurs when the word speaks the word in the power of the Holy Spirit. St. Simeon, the new theologian in the 11th century, developing Gregory of Nyssa's work further in his ethical discourses, connects the concept of the word and breath in God's ineffable speech, the thing which the apostle Paul hears, things that are not, quote, things that are not to be told that no mortal is permitted to repeat. For Simeon, this ineffable speech, inclusive of speech and mouth, has its ultimate end in the Eucharist. He says, and I quote, I say that the ineffable speech which Paul heard spoken in paradise were the eternal things which eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, nor the heart of man conceived. These things which God has prepared for those who love him are not protected by the heights, nor enclosed in some secret place, nor hidden in the depth, nor kept at the ends of the earth or the sea. No, they are right in front of you, before your very eyes. So what are they? Together with the good things stored up in heaven, these are the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which we see every day and eat and drink. In conclusion, in the Mass, when the priest elevates uh, the Eucharist, the bread and the wine, and says, behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world, blessed are those who, who are called to the supper of the Lamb, and we respond, Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. Do we mean what we say? Can the word or blessing sent from a particular place carried by the spirit to the various locations through digitally mediated sacred space to believers in agreement have an effect on our hearts? If so, why can't the same word or blessing sent in the direction of reserved bread and wine also cause an effect by faith within the materials before us. Pentecostals recovering the theology and practice of the Eucharist during COVID-19 believe that a duly ordained celebrant can indeed be at a particular location, pray the epiclesis through visually mediated sacred space to believers who are in agreement and actively participating throughout various geographical locations, and that if this constitutes a valid Eucharistic assembly, then the bread and wine those believers have before them can also be constituted as a valid Eucharist after the truly ordained celebrant who stands in persona Christi says the word. Thank you. Thank you to everyone for being with us and thank you to Dr. Alvarez for your presentation. I want to introduce a little bit of my own context. Um, I'm aware, I think I'm not popping up on people's screens as the speaker. I don't think I can control that, however. No, I see you. Okay, then I'm just not on my own screen, which is fine. I have no particular desire to see myself. Um, 
So a bit about my own context and what brings me to this conversation. Although I teach at a Roman Catholic college, I am an Episcopalian and I'm an Episcopalian from that very high church end of the Episcopal church where something like daily mass would prior to the pandemic have been at the center of my own spiritual experience. But my local congregation has not gathered for any kind of worship at all since the pandemic. So it's been more than a year now. And within the Episcopal church, we do not permit remote consecration, consecration of the elements over Zoom or over a digitally mediated um, environment. This is something that is forbidden by the rubrics of the 1979 Book of Common Prayer, which re requires a priest to touch the elements. But there are other traditions of Anglicanism, including in the Anglican Church of Canada, where this is already happening. So this is not something about which there is a unanimous Anglican position. However, I've been struck that almost all of the debates that have taken place within our own denominational context have primarily been about the question of validity. Can a priest validly consecrate bread and wine with just the word as the mediating factor through a screen? And I'm con increasingly convinced that this may actually be the wrong question. I think it's entirely possible that bread and wine can indeed be validly consecrated through a digital medium, but that you might not want to do it. And I think that there's an element of ritual action that's important beyond the mere question of validity. If we think historically, there are any number of things that people have chosen to do with a validly consecrated host that the church has ultimately decided that perhaps one should in fact not do, right? Um, Within the realm of popular piety, there were things like sprinkling the Eucharist over your crops to make your crops grow, sticking it in a beehive to make your hive produce more honey, putting it in a love potion to attract the object of your desire. And if you'd prefer some things that had legitimate ecclesiastical sanction rather than popular piety, there were things like enclosing the Eucharist within the altar alongside the relics to consecrate the altar of a church. There were things like wearing the Eucharist around your neck for protection while you were traveling, which were completely church sanctioned practices that eventually the church came to think, you know, maybe not so much. Maybe this is not the right way that we want to use the Eucharist. And ultimately what all of those things had in common is that they extracted the consecrated elements from the communal and ritual context of the liturgy and sort of fetishized them as objects that you could sort of take and use for ritual purposes outside of the communal and ritual context in which they originated. I've been very struck that a lot of our conversations about domestic worship and people worshiping from their own homes seem to assume that people are embedded within a family context. Um, and most of the most moving stories that I have heard about people who had very positive experiences of um, worshiping in the Eucharist on Zoom or something like that, take place within the context of a family and a household where people are able to give the elements to one another and to receive them from one another because it seems to me that the ritual logic of the Eucharist is a pattern of giving and receiving. But if I were to take play, to take part in some kind of Zoom Eucharist, my ritual action would actually be a completely different one. I would be sitting here feeding myself the Eucharist, which is a really different kind of gesture. Most of Christian ritual, it seems to me, is embodied communally whether we're talking about the entirety of the gathered congregation or between just two people. But I can't baptize myself. I can't anoint myself. I can't ordain myself. And I would argue that I also can't really feed myself the Eucharist 
it does something different in terms of the ritual action that's taking place. I think this is true for Christian rituals even beyond sacraments. On the Western church calendar, tomorrow is Maundy Thursday. And, you know, both last year and also this, churches sent out all kinds of helpful resources for how you can celebrate Maundy Thursday at home. Um, and most of these assume that your home consists of a family. And it talks about how you can practice foot washing within your family context. And there's often a footnote or a parenthetical note that says, if you live alone, you can wash your own feet. Well, that's not the same thing. It's not the same thing at all, right? It's the same material element of foot washing, but you're actually now using it in a completely different way. It's a completely different economy of gesture. And I think that it is also the same with the Eucharist where it's one thing if you have the church gathered in microcosm and that Christian community is able to share Eucharist which might be consecrated by a priest who happens to not be present. But it doesn't really work the same for those of us who live alone. And I know that we have people joining this webinar from around the world and obviously national contexts differ, but within the American context, more than 30% of American households consists of one person living alone. And many of those other households that do consist of families don't necessarily include family members who practice the same religion. Right? We often have this, this fiction of sort of the, the family as the domestic church in microcosm where you have um, two parents and like ador adoring children who will listen to your every word as you expound the word and do some kind of ritual domestically. And that's actually not the experience for a lot of people for whom even if they do live in a family context, they don't necessarily experience their family life as some kind of church in microcosm. And I think that, you know, that question of what one does with the Eucharist is for me much more important than whether it's validly consecrated, right? Many churches are also doing sort of like drive-through communion where, you know, you can go and you can pick up your consecrated bread and wine and then take them home and eat them in front of your computer screen by yourself. I'm actually just as troubled by that. Um, I think that's just as problematic. I also, um, I will confess to you that I do have the reserved sacrament in my home. And I will say a bit more about that in a minute, but I think it would be deeply problematic if I kept the reserved sacrament in my home in order to just, you know, eat it by myself sitting in front of my computer. Um, however, that would be functioning for me ritually. I don't think it would be a spiritually helpful thing. And I often hear people in these conversations say, well, ultimately, you know, what's the harm of doing a Zoom Eucharist? Um, worst case scenario, people are doing spiritual communion with props. Um, you know, even if it's not actually the body and blood of Christ, they're having spiritual communion, they're desiring communion, and they just are doing that with the benefit of some bread and wine. But I do think that ritual action forms us in particular ways. Um, my spiritual director would be so happy to hear me say this, but like the Eucharist is not magic right? Um, I've often had to have spiritual directors point out to me that the Eucharist is not magic because I kind of think deep down it, it is a little bit, but it's not just a matter of somehow getting my magical bread and however I get it, I get it and it will do its, its work on me. It's that the entire ritual action of the Eucharist does its work on me and that includes receiving it from another human being and receiving it in community with others and not simply, you know, feeding it to myself, having received it directly through the mediation of the Holy Spirit. So what's the alternative? Um, because I'm keenly aware as someone who has basically been without Eucharist for a year that, um, you know, simply offering people nothing is not necessarily the most helpful thing either, right? I mean, um, it's easy to critique sort of the spiritual equivalent of junk food, but when you're spiritually starving to death, um, you're going to seize upon whatever you can. Within my own tradition, we have 
really tried to revive this whole idea of spiritual communion. And the Book of Common Prayer only talks about this in the context of communion of the sick. And it assures the sick person that if they desire to receive communion but cannot, all the benefits of communion are received. Um, I'm not entirely sure if I'm fully persuaded of that. I think that um, you know, within the theological tradition of spiritual communion, there would be a strong strain of seeing it as not quite fully the same as the full experience of receiving communion. But let's just pretend for, you know, that I believe what my own church is telling me in the Book of Common Prayer. I think the problem is that theology as a spiritual communion developed in contexts where there was a much more robust metaphysical understanding of the spiritual, right? Um, I think for most of us today, whether we want to think this or not, the spiritual is like less real. People will say that something is just spiritual or merely spiritual. Um, is Christ really present in the Eucharist or is Christ spiritually present in the Eucharist by which we mean not really present, right? But no one in the period of time in which these theologies were formulated would have said that the spiritual was less real. Um, you know, if anything, the spiritual was more real. But I think the problem that I find for myself is even when I don't mean to, the whole category of the spiritual can very easily slip into the category of the imaginary. So I've often said over the past year, like during this pandemic year, I have developed an admirably robust practice of spiritual writing. Um, I have desired to write things, many books, multiple articles, all kinds of talks and presentations. I have desired to write them. I have thought about writing them. And if the words never seem to actually make it on the page, well, I wanted to, right? I'm really sure that I really wanted to. And although I absolutely know that the theology of spiritual communion ought to be something far more concrete than like Liza's imaginary practice of spiritual writing or spiritual dishwashing or spiritual floor sweeping or all of these other things that I desire to do and yet seem to not be doing. They really bleed into each other in ways that I'm not entirely comfortable with. And this ultimately is why um, I have chosen to keep the reserved sacrament in my home, which is not explicitly permitted by Anglicanism, but it is also not forbidden. And um, this is a practice that was originally forbidden by the Fourth Lateran Council. And I think it's quite obvious that Anglicans in general don't seem to accept Lat Lateran Four. And so I feel justified in this. But the reason that that's important to me is because if Christ is fully present in each fragment of the Eucharist, in a certain sense, that means the church, which is the body of Christ, is also fully present, really objectively present in a way that goes beyond the kind of communion we're having right now over Zoom. And, you know, you can love something without needing to possess it. And for most of Christian history, the Eucharist was absolutely at the center of Christian piety, but people received communion very infrequently, right? And so there is a sense in which, you know, the church can be fully Eucharistic and have the Eucharist at the absolute core and the absolute center of its spiritual identity without actually needing to consume. Um, one of my favorite things is that in the early month of the pandemic, um, many of my Protestant friends rather sheepishly called up their local Roman Catholic parish and asked to borrow a monstrance. Um, and there was a whole lot of monstrance sharing going on. And I was like, wow, you know, ecumenical ocular communion in the 21st century. Who knew that this was gonna be the new trend? I am so here for it. And I'd like to end with just one sort of provocative thought of something that I'm still thinking about because as many of us have really been leaning into spiritual communion and trying to find ways to do that that are meaningful, one of the things that I'm struck by and one of the things that I'm really very troubled by as an ecumenist is that we're mostly still doing spiritual communion separately, right? I'm tuning into Anglican Eucharists to do spiritual communion. And that is actually really bizarre. 
um, as all of the sort of the external trappings that have separated our churches fall away and we're left only with the word and only with our desire for communion, why in the world are we doing denominationally, denominationally separate spiritual communion, right? What's going on with that? And even as I critique that, I usually find that that's precisely what I'm doing. Um, but there's absolutely no good theological rationale for that. And it's interesting to me that um, when we have been prohibited from gathering um, for the actual incarnate celebration of the Eucharist within our gathered church community, it's fascinating to me that we have not chosen to worship more ecumenically and said like, look, absolutely everything that we're able to do right now are things that technically we can be doing together in terms of liturgies of the word and spiritual communion. So why are we not doing that? Why am I the president of the North American Academy of Ecumenists like watching pre-recorded liturgies of Anglican Eucharists rather than going to my local Roman Catholic parish and having spiritual communion? And I do not have an answer to that. But I think it's a worthwhile question for all of us to be asking ourselves because I haven't really noticed anyone else doing that either. And and so um, with that, I will stop so that we have some time for question and answers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Liza. Wonderful, uh, well, wonderful questions and thank you, thank you for your talk. Um, I invite all participants again to submit questions with the Q&A. We've got about 12 minutes of, of time now for questions and, and answers. We had one question directed at Bishop Alvarez about uh, in the middle of his talk about uh, whether, whether or not um, a Eucharist at, at home could be considered fully, uh, fully sacramental. And I believe by the end of his talk, Bishop Alvarez answered, uh, and answered that question that it is possible and it does happen when the, when the assembly is gathered in, uh, in agreement. I'd like to turn back to, to Peter Fahn. We have, a, we have a question for him, and perhaps this also would involve some reflections on, um, uh, on, what, on what Liza just said about the, about the domestic church. Uh, thank you to Peter Fahn for reminding us about the, the, Council, the Second Vatican Council's teaching of the real presence of, of Christ. Families gathered around their homes during COVID-19 to hear the word proclaimed and to pray together. How significant is this family worship at home together in the history of Catholic praxis? Should we think about this domestic church as a, as a key to the way we understand parish liturgies? Uh, speak a little bit, please, about the, the domestic church in, in Catholic piety. All right, thank you very much. That is a very uh, uh, to the point question of my presentation. The notion of Ecclesia Domestica, or even in Latin, Ecclesiola, a small church, domestic small church, even the expression seemed to dismiss it as somehow it's not a real uh, church. Uh, that's why it is called a small Ecclesiola. If we really take into account the fact that, as Vatican II said, the, uh, the, the presence of Christ is equally present in all the four forms, the word and in the uh, priest and in the people, the congregation and in the uh, uh, Eucharistic species. In the, there is no reason why you, you could see, uh, uh, you have to view the domestic church as somewhat less or, or competitive to the church as a whole. Those are not two competitive notions, either the church as is real or, or the domestic church. So I, I, in my reflections, the, the first part, ecclesi uh, ecclesiolog ecclesiology, I think those two things are, must be brought together the church as the body of Christ and the church as the domestic family. Now, I am very um, grateful to Dr. Elizabeth Anderson for reminding us that of almost one third uh, of people living by himself, herself. So, but normally um, the, the word family tend to say that there is least parents or children and so forth. And usually it is the mother or father, usually the mother who gather the uh, family together to uh, listen to the word, uh, 
and then to recite the story of the Last Supper and then the sharing of the uh, food. I think all this is part of the Ecclesia Domestica that we need to rediscover, especially after the COVID-19 has disappeared and we are going back to the quote unquote pre-pandemic uh, uh, celebration. I have a question for Dr. Anderson about the idea of receiving the Eucharist from another if you're, um, um, if you're run the risk of communing at home, as, uh, as, as you talked about. Um, is, is this problem with um, the, the importance of reception from another person, is it primarily for you a matter of theology or is it primarily a matter of liturgical, uh, liturgical law? Um, and could you talk about the distinction between those two spheres of the question? Sure. Yeah, you know, originally a lot of this understanding was based on liturgical praxis within my own denomination, which I have since come to learn is not universal. Um, but one thing that, you know, was really important to me was thinking about how even though priests do commune themselves, they receive the elements from the laity at the offertory. Uh, which I've since learned is not universal practice. But to me, there's something in that liturgical logic um, where no one simply takes this and does it for themselves, but that there is a kind of cyclical thing where everyone takes and everyone receives. Um, it's very Anglican actually that we do theology from the liturgy. So I'm sort of like, of course, these are not separate spheres. We do our theology by looking at the prayer book and what we're already doing liturgically. But I think like, something that's important to me theologically is that what we do with our bodies matters, right? And um, it's very easy for those of us who are theologians to turn this into purely sort of like an intellectual exercise about belief and what we think. But one of the, the kind of mean things I love to do to my Roman Catholic friends, this is, this is a little cruel, but I love taking them on like, tours of my Anglo-Catholic parish and walking by the tabernacle to see if they're gonna genuflect because every single somatic cue screams to them that they should. But like deep down intellectually, they usually feel like they really shouldn't. And you can actually just like watch them basically short circuit as the body screams to genuflect and the brain screams like, no, you really shouldn't. Like it's probably not valid, probably consecrated by a woman who might be married to another woman and like not in valid apostolic succession, really shouldn't do it. But no matter what they think, their body usually does really want to genuflect because every cue in the space suggests that you should. And to me, that's actually just as important as whatever is going on intellectually. Um, both of those things form us. And one of the things that's been very challenging for me about online worship is that it doesn't really involve the body in the same way, right? And sort of like, I'm watching liturgy while lying in bed, snacking on ice cream, being like, oh yes, the great litany. I love it when they do the great litany and you get all the good penitential stuff. And it's like, there's something here that's not in sync in ways that, um, you know, the, the kind of communal somatic experience of um, worshiping um, in more physical ways that um, draw in all of your senses, just do work on. Um, so that's a bit of an answer, but I'm gonna, basically my answer is the Anglican one of, um, we do theology from the liturgy and that's the main source of theology. Thank you. F following up on that, if someone lives in, a, a normal family in the traditional sense of a, you know, to, to worshiping parents that have, uh, uh, have, have worshiping children with them, a family where people s s serve each other in the spirit of the Eucharist and pray together authentically. Um, how do you see the situation then for online worship? I mean, can, can we talk about real communion available through digitally mediated sacred space? Yeah. So I think you can, and I also think you shouldn't. And um, I mean, I think it's valid, but I think there's a number of things that one can do that are valid that are not necessarily practices that one wants to adopt because, you know, do you want to make the nuclear family stand in as an icon of the church in that way? Um, there are people who do. Um, I'm not one of them. But one of the things that I have found troubling, you know, is that we do historically, Anglicans don't permit 
clergy to say private Eucharists. And I could talk at very great length about what does and doesn't constitute a private Eucharist. But the primary way that people have gotten around that during the pandemic is that since most of our clergy are married, the one place that the Eucharist usually is being celebrated is, is by a priest, their spouse, and their children. And you watch this sort of micro unit of the church, you know, the church in microcosm celebrating the Eucharist for you on a screen. And it's always an individual nuclear family. And I understand all of the pandemic reasons why that is the case. And I actually find that um, troubling as an ecclesiology, um, as someone who, um, you know, has spent my entire adult life single and feels, um, you know, that that's probably going to be a permanent vocational call for me. But like, what does that do Sunday after Sunday after Sunday for more than a year when the representation you see ecclesiologically of the church is always of a nuclear family? Um, it's the kind of thing where um, I don't think it's invalid, um, but when it becomes a kind of repeated practice, like how is that functioning iconographically? Is this helpful for us? I'm inclined to think that it's possibly not. Thank you. Um, I'll put this question to the whole panel, but uh, I'd, I'd like Bishop Alvarez, please, to address it first. Uh, th this comes from Samuel Wagner at Georgetown University. Um, how do pre-recorded worship services factor into this conversation about real communion and the, the ability to, to consecrate or, over digital space? If there is agreement to participate virtually, does that participation need to be live? Um, you know, many churches rebroadcast services later in the day or archive services on, on YouTube. Can participation in a recorded service be considered real participation in the body in, in the body of Christ? And would the service need to be watched within a certain period of time, perhaps the same liturgical day? Uh, how, how do we think about this question between live, the live versus recorded in the, the context of, uh, of consecration at distance? That's a, uh, an excellent question, one that um, we haven't had to wrestle with in my context in Pentecostalism. Um, of course, uh, to make sure that we clarify and qualify, um, we are talking about and reflecting upon uh, what it means to have a, a mass during COVID-19 pandemics uh, or the like. Um, and so we are talking about and reflecting upon what it would mean to have a mass uh, what constitutes a Eucharistic assembly during um, a pandemic, which is totally different from going back to, quote unquote, the pre-COVID um, services. Um, what we have done and everything that we have done in our Pentecostal context, um, which I can speak for, um, has always been live. And so uh, we have attempted to keep as much as possible um, that, synchrona that, that, that synchrony of that synergy, excuse me, that um, togetherness um, in digitally mediated space that is live so that there is an actual active participation via digitally mediated space. Um, for me, uh, I don't know that I think they once they've asked me, could you do it? And I kind of refused uh, because I did not see, for me at least, it's a stretch. I did not see um, that there could be um, a recording of me, but not me there with them there, uh, hearing my, my voice in real time, praying the epiclesis, saying the words of the institution, going through the mass, um, and me believing as the celebrant that they're participating through uh, being active through their responses at home, them seeing me. And so I, I, I you know, I bulk that, that um, I am a little uncomfortable by it, um, but I'm open to um, experiencing and reflecting upon what my other colleagues would have to say about it. Yeah, I find this a really helpful question because we often talk about um, online Eucharist as though it's just one phenomenon. And Within my own denomination, practices vary, but locally, the practice has been entirely 
pre-recorded things which are purely spliced together. So all of the little bits are individually recorded and then they're sort of digitally edited. And it really bothers me because it never existed at any one time as a coherent whole. Um, it really is a purely synthetic digital thing that we've manipulated and created. And it's basically, you know, we do it that way because it's aesthetically better. And in some ways, our love of aesthetics is like the great denominational sin of Anglicanism. And it's like, we will die on that hill. And like, we know the Holy Spirit is really present when we have like crafted a really good liturgy that appropriately stirs your emotions and you get all of like the aesthetics in there. Um, but I do actually find it troubling. And if you really push me, I I don't really think that's valid, um, even for the people who are present, because I'm like, it's interesting, you know, you've got a priest consecrating the Eucharist completely not out of context with the scriptures, because the people who recorded those did it separately, and we just sort of like put them together into a video afterwards. And so I actually think this is a really important question, and that when we talk about these issues, we can't talk about online Eucharist as though it's a singular thing. With, um, with that, we'll have to move on to our second panel to, to maintain our time. Our, our second panel involves two speakers about grassroots initiatives emerging from the COVID pandemic. We will hear first from Dr. Cristina Hiedel Gomez, the presentation, the presentation sister's lecturer for BBI, the Australian Institute of Theological Education. She is also pastoral associate for staff at the Australian Catholic University and a research fellow at Charles Stewart University. Her first book is entitled Church as Woman and Mother, published in 2018. And she will be followed by Dr. Paul Zulehner, Professor Emeritus of Pastoral Theology at the University of Vienna. Dr. Zulehner has author authored more than 50 books and is widely re regarded as one of the leading Catholic pastoral theologians in the European context. His most recent book came out two months ago, surveying and analyzing responses to the pandemic in European Catholic churches. Dr. Gomez, the floor is yours. Good morning, uh, good evening, good day, and mabuhai. I'm speaking from uh, the Guringai country, the land of the Gadigal people, the traditional owners of the northern beaches of Sydney, Australia. I will begin with the introductory prayer my family and friends used when uh, we gathered in my home and eventually gathered online as God's people. Today, we, the people of God, gather to hear and respond to God's word, giving thanks and praise. During this time when we are cut off from the parish celebration of the Eucharist, we return to the roots of our faith, gathering in this home as the early disciples gathered in house churches, such as the one led by Priscilla and Aquila, Paul's co-workers in the ministry of Christ Jesus. Our community here makes its worship in union with the church throughout the world, with Francis, our Pope, our bishops, pastors, and all our sisters and brothers, including those who are unable to be with us as we remember and break bread as Jesus taught. COVID-19 brought not only illness and death, but heightened anxiety, depression, isolation, marginalization, and domestic violence. No one could doubt the reasons for continuing to meet as a faith community in a time of great need. It was the how that posed the problem. While my family and friends were happy to imitate the house churches of the early centuries, I saw others around us turn to online masses as the next best thing to attending mass in person. I watched as priests and their assistants fumble with phone cameras, lighting and sound, while people like my mother and father-in-law, May and Brian, learned for the first time how to access videos on Facebook in order to watch amateur productions. But even the best of productions left some frustrated and wanting more. Mass in any case is not meant to be a video to be simply observed. As Vatican II's constitution on the sacred liturgy tells us, it has to be something that the faithful fully, actively and consciously participate in, expressing and manifesting Christ in the Sunday gathering as much as in their daily lives. How much then could the online mass enable this full active and conscious participation? And I noticed um, Emilia Alvarez had brought this question up. At the same time, migrant friends had expressed that for the first time, they could access mass in their mother tongue from their small unknown hometowns. 
connecting in this way from the other side of the world gave them comfort and connection during a time when distancing and isolation was the norm. In addition, it is not as if televised masses were a new invention during COVID-19 lockdowns. They have been around for decades. While Pope Francis dispensed Catholics from the obligation to attend Sunday mass and communed, communicated that the prayer of spiritual communion was, equi it was equivalent to having received Jesus in the host themselves. I watched people like May consume bread after the priest online had consecrated and consumed his own. May had no understandings of the workings of tra transubstantiation or what the constitution on the sacred liturgy said about active participation. And she would never imagine that the bread she consumed was consecrated by the priest through the screen. But eating the bread, tasting and touching it, sharing it with her husband who also watched the mass online with her, enabled her to feel she was an active participant of the drama of the mass unfolding before her. As a pastoral associate to staff at a Catholic university, I noticed some staff members who attended daily masses would never consider attending a liturgy of the word with or without communion. To them, the mass where the priest consecrated the host was the only liturgy worth attending. And this way of thinking is not surprising given that Catholics are taught that the Eucharist is the source and summit of Christian life. For the university staff who, att who often attended mass, they believed the Eucharist was solely the host. And yet when deprived of access to this and when online masses left them feeling somewhat dissatisfied, many surprisingly found the liturgy of the word which I had prepared for them to celebrate with their families and friends fed their souls much more so than online masses could. We teach in theology and religi religious studies that in the liturgy, there are four presences of Christ, the host, the priest, the word proclaimed and the gathered people. And yet I saw before COVID lockdowns, a focus on the host and the priest to the extent that Christ's present presence in the word and the people was completely marginalized. With COVID lockdowns, this ordering was turned upside down so that the faith community were not only called to question Jesus as validly present in the word and the gathered community, but also equally present. For my immediate family and like-minded friends, we did not even consider engaging, engaging with online masses. Rather, after many years of feeling frustrated about what mass could look like, from years of theological studies, as well as having experienced house churches ourselves, we felt this was the opportunity to finally implement liturgies that celebrated inclusivity, welcome and diversity. These liturgies, which we considered were Eucharistic, included inclusive language, feminine image, images of God, a shared Lexio Divina following the gospel that involved all participants instead of a sermon by an individual, a thanksgiving and an affirmation of ourselves as the body of Christ by passing bread among us, and the use of both women and men or couples to preside and preach. As the beginning prayer showed, we felt we were returning to our Christian roots where house churches were the norm, where God's word was preached and proclaimed by those who actually had the gift to lead and to preach, no matter their race, status or gender, as feminist and liberation theologians have reminded us over and again, based on Galatians 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Thus, we felt we were not moving away from tradition or breaking unity with the universal church, but rather exercising a ressourcement in the way of Vatican II and the liturgical, liturgical movements that fed the ideas of the council. It was not simply a domestic gathering, but worship open to attendance by any of the baptized and therefore rightly called litur liturgia. The house church more importantly enabled us to connect with our children and each other in a way that was not possible at a parish Sunday Eucharistic gathering. Now, some would describe our house church as nothing but shared personal prayer that needs to be followed by Sunday mass. <laughs> 
the base ecclesial communities of Latin America and the Christian life communities inspired by Ignatian spirituality are examples of such groups who engage in God's word before attending the Sunday celebration. Given the added element of sharing bread as a faith community, the liturgies within our house church were more aligned with those conducted by We Are Church in Ireland or the Ben and Casa community in New York or the Maria 2.0 movement in Germany, where their liturgies sought to be opposite of the Roman hierarchical church. Such communities would call their ga gatherings not simply liturgies of the word, but affirm that as the baptized body of Christ are already Eucharistic and thus include the sharing of bread. My house church experience was emblem emblematic of what was taken up all over the world by reform groups, interested in implementing the ideals of Vatican II, Pope Francis's welcoming and person-centered church, as well as the ideals of a faith community based on Galatians 3.28. In January 2020, before COVID-19 became a pandemic, a number of women, including myself and one man from various countries were gather gathered together in Rome by Voices of Faith or VOF. VOF had worked for many years to have women's voices heard by the Vatican and had held events within the Vatican until in 2018, the Vatican rejected Mary McAleese as a keynote speaker and thus forced VOF to hold their event outside of the Vatican. In January 2020, VOF decided to create the Global Catholic Women's Council or CWC to encourage all Catholics to become united in their action of reform within their churches, but also to take action according to what was appropriate for their local contexts. With the support of VOF and CWC, individuals and groups who signed up to be members of CWC then took up the opportunity during COVID lockdown from early 2020 to hold liturgies within their homes as well as over Zoom to feed their souls with what they had felt were missing in their own Sunday gatherings. The inclusive language, the female presence in leadership, the celebration of key moments from the Bible which highlighted the value of women. CWC held international Zoom liturgies prepared by women, for women and presided by women. The CWC celebrated an international Easter liturgy where Mary Magdalene as the apostle to the apostles had a priority of place. They held an international liturgy for Pentecost where the role of the spirit as birther, reformer and transformer of women's lives had central place. CWC also held an international liturgy on the feast of Mary Magdalene, giving this great apostle to the apostles the prominence she has long deserved. These celebrations show how much a number of women all over the world had been feeling, feeling undernourished by the Roman rite and were longing for affirmation as women, but not simply as mothers or helpers, rather as equals to men and able to lead and preach as men. The women long to be equally acknowledged in the language, the stories, the prayers and the images for the Trinitarian God used by their faith communities. Recently, I have become more conscious of the effect of patriarchal liturgies on my spiritual life and sense of self. For a number of months, I found it difficult to pray. And after one session with my spiritual director, we came to the conclusion that I couldn't pray because I couldn't connect with God the Father. We realized God as mother was what I had needed in my life. And whilst I understood this intellectually as a feminist theologian, through the patriarchal liturgies that I attended almost daily as a pastoral associate in my university, I had absorbed an image of God as ex exclusively male. And this is the power of the liturgy, the power of ritual as Liz Anderson has pointed to us earlier. Thus, there is the need for more diversity in language and images for God and God's people in church rituals. I wish to end my presentation with a sample of some of the prayers used at one CWC international online liturgy celebrating Pentecost. They show the concerns of global women during lockdown, but also their deep faith, their longing for acknowledgement and healing from the sin of patriarchy and other discriminations in the church and society, and the discovery of their own voices by participating in our international Zoom liturgies. From India, Astrid Lobo Gajuwala had prayed, come O Holy Spirit, ever present, ever moving, freedom giver, 
bringer of new life. Make our hearts burn with the fire of your love that we may remove obstacles and make new paths towards our neighbors, women, men, children, jobless laborers on the streets of Mumbai with nothing, only a longing to reach home in a village now out of reach. From Italy, Elsa Ferrario had prayed, Lord, I am a woman who lives with an abusive husband, a teenage daughter and a young son. During the long weeks of seclusion, the house became my prison. I ask you for the spirit of Tamar, the daughter of King David, also violated at home by one of her relatives. She screamed, but her cry was stifled by those in the house. But you listened to her. Hers has become the voice of denunciation of violence. With this spirit, I am not afraid to cry out, to ask for help from the anti-violence associations for me and for my children, because I know that you, Lord, are the spirit of freedom and care. From South Africa, Sheila Perez had prayed, may the spirit of Ubuntu triumph over anxiety and fear of the unknown. We pray for that same spirit to reign in our church, in our church, once we are loosened from the lockdown chains of the COVID-19 pandemic. Finally, here is the introduction used at the Pentecost liturgy, encompassing the questions that the women held collectively and from many countries as they met together online. At this table, everybody is welcome. During this time when churches have been closed, Christian believers have been forced to ask many questions about this table. Where is it if it cannot be inside churches? Does the table have to be inside churches or are there other tables outside? Are the tables inside and outside connected or are they irreparably disconnected? While there are many tables, we are all called to the one feast of God. The guests of this one feast have always been called into constant new beginnings. Now the table itself has been called into its own new beginning. How do we become this new table without judgment, with care and welcome, not only for the neglected among us, but also the most annoying and disagreeable? How do we remain at this same table, but also courageously become its empowering and inclusive version? In these times of lockdown, what bread have we been consuming? What bread will continue to sustain us? Moreover, what bread can we offer others to remind us of all of our deepest identity, which is as God's beloved, the body of Christ, God's hands and feet on earth, sharing in Jesus' priestly, prophetic and pastoral mission. Thank you very much for inviting me to this webinar. My contribution, I will, in my contribution, I will present three highlights based on my Corona study, online study made in 2020. And uh, I will give you some data. And uh, as consequence, I will formulate question, a question or a think about, and I'm based on this survey which is a social scientific uh, gathering of data and is not yet the needed theological reflection on the second level, as Karl Rahner told me when I was studying in Innsbruck. More than 15,000 people participated in the online study, and most of them had a academic training uh, and therefore I think this is an, a kind of expertise about our question. Uh, the COVID uh, survey was about the fears and the anxieties, the values which are struggling with each other and the role of the churches. And in a special part of, this, of the questionnaire, we asked about the broadcasted services and so I give you three main points. This is the overview over these three uh, the theses I propose to you, these highlights. So the first one is people who participate in a mess on screen are highly diverse in terms of their previous Eucharist, uh, Eucharistic experience. So the second point or the second highlight, uh, 
the televised services did not broadcast the celebration of a congregation, but those, this of the liturgical actors. Uh, it was a deeply change in the format of presentation. And the third highlight I'm speaking over in the pandemic, unseen officially liturgical reform laboratories arose in homes where according to Tertullian was celebrating without the priest what is handed down us from the Lord. And what does this mean theologically? This will be the question. I'm speaking about the church in the houses, not in the families, uh, not even not in the nuclear, nuclear families, but when uh, more households came together. This is the situation in our survey. So let's start with a preliminary table who uh, switched on the this home services, who took part. And if you look at this table, you see firstly in the last line that uh, from the participants on the survey, only 9% never sat before the screen, once 9%, and 48% uh, took part several times and often 34 persons. And if you look on the columns, you see who took part often. And we had done a break with the mass attendance. And then you see who was several times a week before pandemic time in the church participating on the Eucharist, then 50 55% of them were often sitting before the screen. And this goes down to 3% often, but the yellow marked figures you see in the uh, last hardly never was in the church before the pandemic. Then several times were 26 persons uh, sitting before the screen to watch these uh, broadcasted services. So let me look deeper in the next chart. We had implemented in the questionnaire these six items. The first three are asking how important is to the coming together in the church. The second item you see Christian worship lives from coming together in a church community. Or in the time of the lockdown, the first one, I missed Sunday service in the church community. So go down, do the broadcasting, how do, how do the, the interviewees feel these broadcasted services? And they say the good experiences with the broadcasted casting of services will induce some of some to continue to, to celebrate a service in this way in the future. So the church. Uh, don't forget this practice in the future. In future, churches should continue to offer good digital services and so on. And statistically, we can combine different uh, items and look, are there similar groups or types with similar answers? And this we named the cluster analysis. And here is the result of this cluster analysis. And this is, I think, for our discussions, an important result, because you see first that there are some people who accept only the coming together in an analog way. Uh, they don't like the virtuality of services. You see below the figures are 31%, 33%, 24%, but above you have 73 to 94 percent. I call this time the type the analog type, who is wanting to, to say, well, it's nearly impossible to celebrate Eucharist in, uh, in a transmitted uh, service of sitting before the screen. You must come physically together because uh, you can't be married without being present. You can't have confession without be present, and therefore you must be together in a real community that you can celebrate Eucharist. Then the next type, I, I call them the virtuals, 
have very high figures uh, in the items about virtual transmission and broadcasting and very low uh, uh, zero percent in the first item that they missed the Sunday service in the church community. And then there is uh, the hybrid type. I call it hybrid because they like both types, the analog coming together and the virtual celebration uh, on the tele TV screen. So here you see how they were distributed. This is not so important, but you see the, the majority within these 12,000 persons we, we should, for which we made the evaluation is analog, belongs to the type of the analog people and 21 percent to the virtuals and the hybrids 27 percent. If you combine these three types with their church attendance, you see the analog and the hybrid, two thirds of them are going to mass every Sunday or were going to mass every Sunday before the pandemic. But if you look at the virtual type, there are only uh, a quarter of them present in a church before pandemic and the others not. So you, you see that virtuality is not connected with real experience, with the experience of a real assembly before the pandemic. And this from there, for, uh, I conclude that you can see different modes of participations. And you see the one, the first part of viewers concelebrated in a, a very strict sense. They were revitalizing their belonging to the sorely missed community before pandemic. And this is of course only possible if there is a form of community experience. For the most analog and hybrid types, this is given. And on the other side, there were many participants in the home services uh, who had no experiences before uh, celebrating the Eucharist in a church assembly. They celebrated as somebody was writing in the comment to the open question, they celebrated like, like couch masses. We have the German term sofa Christen, uh, perhaps uh, drinking beer and something like this. So my, my first thing about it, think about is can virtuality without experience or with revitalized experience be the basis for the celebration for the Eucharist? Huh? So that these are two separate parts of the question, without experience or with revitalized experience. It's perhaps possible that they are making a new experience by the Holy Spirit, but this is not a question of social sciences. So this is the, the first uh, part. The second is I had the possibility uh, to have a long talk with a redactor of the ZDF, this is the second German television broadcasting, uh, and she is responsible for the transmission to the broadcasting of such services in the Protestant and the Catholic Church, and both uh, differ very much in the result. But now for the Catholics, she told me the format of the televised services changed significantly from the time before the pandemic within the time of the pandemic. And what was this change? Yeah? The main uh, element was the absence of the celebrating community. This had a very heavy impact of the transmission of the, of the, the services. It led to a concentration on the liturgical event itself. The images become calmer, she said, and the camera could focus longer on a preacher, but this modified the role of the viewers. Previously, the spectators viewed a celebrating congregation, 
with songbooks and singing and responding to the priest and so on. The people in front of the television became directly involved in the happening. Now, in the broadcasted services, precisely this element fell away. There was no celebrating congregation. There was uh, not a responding uh, congregation either. Yeah? So the transmission of a celebrating community was transformed into a transmission of the performance of the liturgical stuff on the stage of the Presbyterium. And this is, I think, a theological provocation. And this is my second think about. Did this change of the format not turn the liturgical reform of the Vatican II on its head, that the community is celebrating and not the stuff. So I go to my third uh, point. The highlight could be this, that the study shows that after the churches were closed, something like worship labs were formed in the people's homes. I say church in the houses, they flourished similarly to the church in Corinth or someone else. I give you two examples of comments of the interviews and interviewed people. One woman reports that she is grateful for the weekly meeting of my Bible group where we pray, read the Bible, talk about it and share bread and drink wine together, just as Jesus instructed us to do. Or another one participant responded personally, I have benefited very intensively from these opportunities to live my faith. Coming together as a church in the houses, praying together and sharing the word of God as well as the bread of a over which we say the blessing. I can well imagine this also after the pandemic is over. And this person is adding, typic typically Catholic, and it doesn't need ordained priest men. Well, this is a, a picture of such an event in the houses. And my question is now here, if I reflect it as a pastoral theologian, is this a Eucharist format according, for example, to Tertullian in Carthago 209? Here is the Latin quotation, nonne et laici sacerdotes sumus scriptum est regnum quoquenos, and so on. You can read it here in English as lay people are we not priests, it is written. He has made us a kingdom of priests for God's his fathers. The difference between the order and the people constitutes the authority of the church and the honor of the position sanctified by God. Where there is an ecclesiastical order non installed, you yourself offer at immerse. This means uh, offer et timbre. Yeah? You yourself are the priest. Where there are three, there evidently is a church, even if they are lay people. And this is my third thing about is such an emergency Eucharist, theologically real possible, possible in Catholic thinking, of course, this is my position now, uh, but this is an ecumenic question, similar to the allowed emergency baptism, for example. Can in an extraordinary situa situation, a baptized person act priestly without being ordained? I think this is a very heavy question to be discussed. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for the research of the survey. <laughs> Fascinating results, Dr. Dr. Zulaner. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we will. Um, I'd like to move directly to our third panel because it also in, in, involves um, recent liturgical initiatives of a very practical and, and pastoral nature so that um, we can give our, our final speakers enough enough time and then hopefully come back to, to both of these, uh, the, the second panel and the third panel for questions and answers at the end. <laughs> 
Our, our third panel features two pastors who will address liturgical initiatives in their communities during the pandemic. Uh, Reverend Fred Anderson is the retired senior pastor of Madison Avenue Presbyterian Church in New York City and the current chair of the board of the Center of Theological Inquiry in Princeton, New Jersey. Throughout the pandemic, he has worked extensively with pastors and worship communities to celebrate the sacraments, especially the Eucharist, via the internet on Sunday mornings. He will be followed by Reverend Konstantin Lazarkis, a Greek Orthodox priest currently serving at Kemisistis Theotoku Church and at the Dormition of the Virgin Mary Church in Southampton, New York. And he has also served elsewhere in a variety of capacities in the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of America. I thank them both for their presence with us and welcome first the words of Reverend Anderson. Thank you, Jason. And grace to you and peace from the triune God who's revealed most fully to us in our Lord Jesus Christ, who has called us to himself. And by the Holy Spirit binds us to God in Christ and all who belong to Christ, who now binds us together as Christ's holy body in the world around the world this day. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to this wonderful, wonderful convocation. And thanks for those who have made it possible. When the pandemic hit, I was in the process of writing a book on atonement theology for 21st century Christians that places a strong emphasis upon the Eucharist as a moment of realized atonement. I was arguing for the need of it at least weekly to grow into members of God's new creation in Christ. Consequently, I found myself puzzled at how various communions responded, especially those for whom Eucharist is foundational to authentic Christian worship. I encountered everything from refusal to allow the Eucharist to be celebrated to churches, primarily the Reformed tradition, though, as Liza has told us, some Anglicans and even some Roman Catholic communities in Canada were continuing to stream their worship and encourage sacramental participation at home via digital means. On the other hand, the Episcopal Church, where my wife is a member and where we worship, though going to digital services, much like the ones Liza described, was told by our bishop that this was a time for daily prayer and spiritual communion, while others used the phrase fasting on Christ. I know what came of daily prayer. Though I don't know we'd call it spiritual communion in the Zwinglinian stream of Presbyterianism, rather than the full service of word and sacrament that Calvin called on the church to be doing weekly each Lord's day. And I don't commend it to you. Our Presbyterian family is still trying to recover from the, from the, the, the assertion that we are really Zwinglinian. And frankly, fasting on Christ sounds to me too much like a theological oxymoron. The Protestant side of the church has done that far too long, which of course is what my book is all about. So I was both grateful and proud when the highest ecclesiastical officer in our denomination published the decision that during the extremists of the pandemic, pastors could lead Eucharistic worship digitally provided the session of the church authorized its celebration. And so I and my wife have been worshiping weekly since then with several congregations we have served that are fully Eucharistic weekly. In addition, I've been advising pastors who have been exploring this new dimension to sacramentality during the pandemic. I, of course, come from the reform perspective of John Calvin's Geneva and his Eucharistic theology of presence, which, but coincidentally, is known as virtualism. The Holy Spirit, through the worshiper's participation in consecrated bread and wine, lifts the faithful into Christ's risen presence, there to feed on and be fed by him. I had been using the medium of Zoom for several years prior to the pandemic to conduct business meetings for organizations I'm a part of who, became, because of limited budgets, could not come together in person. And I quickly came to appreciate what the digital media could do to bring people from different times and places together in conversation, just as we are together in conversation right now in different times and places to deliberate, to work, to worship, to have fellowship. Already, we had been using it with our family on a weekly basis. We in the Northern New Hampshire, our daughter and her partner in London, another in Brooklyn with her husband, 
And so we have shared holiday dinners for Thanksgiving and Christmas, as well as many a birthday. So too for Sunday worship, as we linked in, sing the hymns, speak the responses, listen for the word and lessons, anthems and sermons, set aside bread and wine as the pastor leads in the Eucharistic prayer digitally. Do I have a sense of co-celebrating, though I'm not behind the table as the official? Yes, but no less than I have every Sunday in our small Episcopal church where I and another retired Presbyterian pastor worship and both stand in the orange position among the people. Please don't tell the bishop. The point is there's very much a sense of community linked to this new virtual media and an awareness of the spirit at work to feed us on Christ. What I've learned from talking with pastors who are holding and streaming broadcasting delayed services is that they've discovered their outreach and ministry has become national, if not global, rather than local. Many former parishioners who had moved away and were finding it hard to find a spiritual home have returned to it virtually. In addition, new people have found themselves at worship and stayed primarily because of the Eucharist and contributions are actually up. One pastor in Minnesota reported a gift of $5,000 from an unknown person in Philadelphia, thanking them for their worship services with the sacrament available to them. So there's no question on the part of the worshipers as to whether this is a quote, authentic moment of worship. Interestingly enough, the only ones I have encountered who asked the question about authenticity have been the professionals. And I've learned that the more they know about their classic sacramental theology, the more opposed to virtual Eucharist they seem to be. But without much clear reasoning, it seems to me. And I've come to think this is not only a serious failure of pastoral responsibility, but also very much a form of veiled clericalism. I've also learned in talking with these people, mostly academics rather than weekly practitioners, that the questions they raise are the same we were arguing over in the 16th century with the same concerns over presence. And then as is now, if I can generalize, it's not if Christ is present, but how. It seems to me that it's time for the church to begin to rethink its sacramental theology in light of 21st century science, especially quantum physics that knows far more about reality than we do and how we are and can be present to one another, especially the risen Lord to us in the spirit. In addition, it's begun to dawn on me that since Vatican II, we've heard a great deal about the importance of the assembly and how essential that assembly is to Christ's presence, one of the four classic means of it, as we've heard today. However, I've begun to ask myself another question. Have we begun to use this as an excuse and I begin to wonder how much our sacramental theology is taking on Pelagian dimensions, making Christ's presence depend upon us rather than upon the spirit. Finally, I have learned that sitting at table with my wife with bread and wine prepared following the pastoral leadership and prayer, gesture, sharing, digital Eucharist has a power and intimacy of its own. Would I trade that for being gathered back in the sanctuary Around the table, cheek to gel, absolutely not. But until then, it's been a tremendous source of spiritual nurture and helped us enormously in pandemic isolation. It is a tangible reminder that Christ is present with us in all things. I suspect that when the time comes, we can return to the sanctuary with singing and embracing. There will still be some who, without this digital gift, will, because of handicapping or other infirming condition, be left out unless the pastoral dimension of what this pandemic has taught us is continued. So I encourage the bishops to think of their pastoral responsibility as well as their ecclesial ones. I, ask asking where, I end asking, where do we go from here? God only knows, but one thing is sure, we will not be going back to life as it was before. So it seems to me the question is, where is God leading us now? And what does it mean to be faithful to Christ in his promised presence among us in bread and wine? Thank you. Hi, everybody. I, I didn't know if I was supposed to jump right in. Um, first, just let me say thank you so much for the honor and the opportunity.
to share a little bit with you today. Um, when uh, the pandemic hit our parish, it was a funny thing because we had been uh, we'd been working on uh, doing a live stream of our divine liturgies and other liturgical services, you know, for shut-ins and when people were traveling, et cetera, just, you know, for the sake of doing it. And we'd run into some technical issues and I'd put it on the back burner. And then uh, when we realized that, uh, that, the, that the church was going to be shut down and people weren't going to be attend, that became priority number one. And uh, all of these questions started to bubble up for us. You know, what does it mean to worship remotely? What's the experience of the faithful? And I, as a pastor and, and as a not really theological, too theologically minded guy, you know, a lot of these questions about the validity of a Eucharist celebrated at home and all that, it kind of feels a little bit above my pay grade. Um, and I thought rather than um, share my opinions or positions on those, I would just share some observations about the experience as of our faithful and try to contextualize them in a little bit um, of some of the predominant thinking in, in, in the Orthodox Church in the pastoral circles that I move in. Um, and the first thing that was kind of interesting for me to contemplate a lot as I saw how various people were responding to remote worship, just a live stream of the Divine Liturgy watching was from home, was to see how different people did it. I had, um, people were sending me pictures of their kids who had made little sensors and had cups like chalices and were lighting candles. And they were saying, oh, we, you know, we love church at home. And then people would send pictures of their husbands in bed saying he's never liked church so much, you know, because the guy's in his pajamas and like drinking his coffee. And one of the things that that raised for me is I think that the efficacious nature and perhaps also the validity of the sacrament really relied upon. And, um, and speaking to the previous speaker's point, the pastoral value was immediately evident because people were engaging and I had people writing me, oh, I never knew that the priest said this. I could never hear those prayers. It's so different without having to look at everybody and what they're wearing. So it really occurred to me that it was a sword that cut both ways. But another thing that I thought about a lot was um, St. Mary of Egypt, who, as many of you know, is an early saint and she, you know, was repentant and, and she went into the desert and she spent her whole life in the desert and only received communion at the very end of her life because she had spent this long period in repentance. And a fellow Orthodox priest, Father Stephen Damnick, um, wrote extensively about how he felt that the pandemic was a call to repentance and that it was a time for us to all move inward and that maybe in this moment in history, God didn't want us in churches. Maybe God wanted us to have some introspection and to, and to take stock on, on how we were with our families and how materialistic we were and how devoted we were and give us a time to recalibrate, to prepare us to come back to church and back to the Eucharist. So for me, it was an interesting pastoral question. And throughout the pandemic, I brought Eucharist to people and didn't discourage anyone from anything they might be doing at home to, you know, to participate in the liturgy and, 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 and to receive the Eucharist, whatever that may or may not mean. Um, but I thought that it was interesting, at least from a pastoral standpoint, to contemplate what it means to not take communion and what it means to take communion and how both of those things can lead us towards salvation and can bring us closer to Christ if they're contextualized correctly within our spiritual lives. So um, the first thing I thought about and don't really have a lot of answers for was the value of receiving and not receiving and how sometimes either one of those things can be what God is giving us for our salvation and as witnessed in St. Mary of Egypt's life, right? Um, and then the varying experiences of all the faithful um, really made me realize that we need to increase our modalities of worship. That's it. I have people who never came to church and probably will never come back to church, but who participate in the liturgy every Sunday and write to me about it and call me about it and, 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 and have a completely enriched experience 
Um, but then I also have folks in my congregation who are like, I just can't do it. Like I, this one woman from Russia, super pious lady, never misses church, has been dragging her kids, and, and really a, 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 an astute theologian in her own right, as a, lay, as a lay person with no formal theological training, says, if I can't be there and smell the incense and make the prostrations and kiss the icons, then I'll just say my prayers. I don't need a TV to do it. I don't need, you know, so on and so forth. Um, and so that was really interesting. But another thing that I've really contemplated a lot is, are, are provisional and permanent aspects of this. And I think it's an open question for all churches, certainly remote worship um, and remote participation are provisional, but certainly because of their pastoral value, they're gonna have to stay. Um, but the one thing that is really compelling for me where I feel that we need to approach um, remote worship and remote Eucharist with caution is two things. One of the, and I'm gonna conclude here, one of the traditions that is so amazing to me in the Orthodox liturgical tradition is that when a priest celebrates the liturgy and there's not another priest to distribute communion to him, right? We always have to have a lay person in church. The, the, the liturgy and the Eucharist are essentially, and they have to be communal, right? That when, if, the, if there's not a bishop to hand the priest the Eucharist, the priest has to pick the Eucharist with one hand and place it to remind the priest that he's not giving himself communion, that he is receiving communion from the body of Christ, i.e. from the church, from the, from the communion of the saints, that he doesn't do it for himself, that it is given to him from the community of faith. And I have teenage kids, and I am like profoundly worried about their understanding of what it is to have a real relationship because so many of their relationships are mediated through a screen and so much of what they do they do through text and social media and then in the pandemic all of their education through zoom and while i think that all of those things are valuable and we don't need to run away or shut down all of them I do sometimes see the church as one of the last holdouts where people get together and hug each other and look each other in the eye. And while I think that there is certainly a place and a future and we need to continue to worship through digital means, I also think we really have to be attentive to the fact that, that Christian worship is a place of real human interaction through digital means, but we do have to embrace one another and we do have to look one another in the eye. We do have to breathe the same air. So I think that as we look to the future, we want to, we want to do both, but not lose sight. Sorry for my uh, ramblings. I'm done. Those were not ramblings at all. That was fascinating. Thank you very much, Father, uh, for your reflections on your on your congregation. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions and answers before we move to our final synthesis. So I, I would invite all participants to type any questions in the Q and A, and please indicate the the panelist to whom the question is directed. I, I'd like to turn first to. Um, to, to Dr. Zulaner, and I, I have two questions for, for him, and one of them is my question, invoking moderator's privilege. <laughs> my, my, my question is, uh, is, is this, you've been a pastoral theologian for decades, certainly when you approached this survey about people's experience with digital worship, you had some inclinations about what the results were going to be. What did you find most surprising about uh, about the survey, were there were there things that uh, that, that that startled you, um, or that taught you something about um, uh, about people's worship online during uh, during this time? Uh, another question that came into the uh, into the Q and A is a canon law question about Canon 1104, paragraph one in the Latin rite of the Catholic Church, which permits the possibility of marriage being validly contracted by proxy 
that it's possible for that sacrament to be celebrated without the two persons being physically together. You can validly contract a marriage by proxy. Is, uh, uh, is this any analog of, of value for the way we think about, um, for the way we think about sacramental worship in digital space, or is it an anomaly of canon law? And you were muted. Okay. Yeah, yes, I activated it. Thank you. May I start with the second question? Yeah, because there is another rule that is not allowed to confess by telephone. Yeah, you have to be present, yeah? and I think it's very reasonable. Yeah, so we are discussing on two levels. If we use the term Eucharist or uh, sacrament, we are speaking on the one hand about the full sacrament, yeah, celebrated in a space and at the same time with the assembly and bringing people together and you have a feeling, a, a body feeling, yeah, if you say, are celebrating this. And uh, I think it, when we speak about the digital, digital, digital services, yeah, sorry, digital services, then uh, there is another equivoc concept of sacrament and Eucharist, yeah, if you speak about this. So I, I think we have, um, my, I, I was very surprised that so many people missed the coming together because the, the community is for them even as so important than the Eucharist uh, celebration uh, is the same, yeah? So both are very important for the people, yeah? So the other one, what I was surprised is then we asked the people, who participated on these home services, as I call them, uh, like home office or homeschooling home service, then so many people who were not at all experienced with real uh, assemblies on, on Sundays in a church yeah, took part and saw this, this performance of the Eucharist. Yeah? But at the same time, many of the ZDF told me that it was easier to broadcast Protestant services than Catholic ones, yeah? It was easier. And I, I think we should uh, think this over again. So these were the two questions, yeah? So what I was very surprised yes. and, and on the other hand, that I think that it is very necessary to be present. I, I mistrust that the the term of the domestic church, I say it freely as pastoral theology, and because we have a tendency to familiarize the church, yeah? And Jesus always told us, no, the church is transfamilial, is global, is in the connection with, within the whole world, is the unity of the whole world, not, not only for families. It, for me, it is a a dangerous privatizing of the Eucharist, uh, which is to be celebrated in churches when they are open and in an emergency, emergency case, well, we can broadcast them additional, but not in the core of the church. It's my opinion as a pastoral theologian, if you ask me. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, we had uh, we, we've had a number of questions about whether people's presentations will be available in written form. Uh, obviously, the recording of this event will be sent out to everyone who registered, likely next week or, or the following. But, uh, but but there is a possibility that we'll be able to share the presentations in written form from the panelists who uh, who, who submit them. So those of you who are registered for for the event will certainly have access to the recording. But hopefully, we'll find a way to facilitate the written form of the presentations if uh, if, if possible. Our final speaker of this webinar has perhaps the most difficult role of all, you know, identifying points of convergence, divergence, and loose ends in the dynamic conversation of the last two hours. And Dr. Aaron Hollander is Associate Director of the Graymore Ecumenical and Interreligious Institute and Associate Editor of Ecumenical Trends. His research concerns the dynamics of ecumenical and interreligious conflict and coexistence, the aesthetic texture and political power of holiness, and the contemporary conditions of sectarianism.
He probably considers those themes utterly simple by comparison with his next task, considering where we go from here and what the future of Eucharist and worship more broadly might be. Dr. Hollander. Thanks so much, Jason. And thanks to all of you who are participating in this for these incredibly rich uh, papers, conversations, um, a lot to think about, a lot to synthesize. And I humbly uh, promise to, to do my best. Um, thanks also to those uh, 88 of you who remain with us. Yes, you too are really present with us um, and we're grateful uh, for your being here as well. Um, this is such a rich conversation and I won't be able to respond in any kind of depth to any one of the, the papers, though I'd, of course I'd love to do so. Um, it's the kind of thing that if I'm being cheeky about it, would be best suited to a couple of beers and uh, some face-to-face -face conversation. But in, in lieu of that, uh, my task is threefold. Uh, I'm gonna highlight some key themes and continuities that I heard expressed uh, among the speakers. Uh, so as to give some kind of synopsis of where we are and where, although these are, are certainly partial um, and provisional comments, um, give us a sense of, some sense of what the, what the lay of the land is. I'll then identify a few puzzles or aporias that remain. Um, I wanna indicate a couple of obstacles that we need to be able to address strategically uh, as we go wherever it is that we're going. And I realize there's, that's not an entirely certain thing, um, but I think we, we have the means to face the puzzles ahead of us, but let's get a little clear on what those puzzles are. And finally, I'm gonna end with one or two questions um, that I won't make any effort to resolve, but I hope that will help us move forward collaboratively uh, in our many different ecclesial and scholarly contexts um, that are far from one another. And yet here we are, uh, as we actually always have been before the pandemic, uh, collaborating and thinking together and working together. So th there are continuities in what we're facing now with what we've been facing, which are not so extreme, I think, as we are often inclined to, to think or fear. That actually is the big one, as far as I'm concerned, the big continuity um, between uh, the papers that we've, we've heard today. And Peter Fan emphasized this right at the outset that the issues we're engaging with are ancient. They're not unprecedented issues. They're not digital age issues. These are um, longstanding questions that we're dealing with in new ways, but that is simply the norm of what it means to do ecclesiology, ecumenism, theology, what have you. We're doing what we've always been doing, and I think we should take heart in that. Not only because, as Peter mentioned, there have been pandemics before. There have been enormous upheavals. Um, the Black Death, for example, uh, uh, not to mention then the more recent pandemics, but also because the issues that are at hand there are issues that hinge on the many technologies with which we encounter and engage with spiritual matters. Humans have always done this. Um, and we've always had to engage with spiritual matters um, in terms of the exigencies and constraints of what we might call different ecological contexts. How do we adapt and, if you like, localize liturgy based on the unavoidable conditions of the world that we find ourselves in? So for example, are there no such thing as sheep or grapes in your environment? Well, you translate your Eucharistic rites to refer to the pig of God, or you use kava instead of wine. These are, these are examples, just a couple that I've encountered in missiological case studies, for instance. Um, so too, is there a pandemic that makes it unsafe to gather for in-person worship? You adapt, you gather online, you gather in homes. Um, so that, that sense of continuity that, that Everything we're talking about today is not really novel. It would be the first, um, the first continuity, <laughs> I mean, itself a continuity that I would raise. Of the ancient issues that I've heard brought up multiple times, and I think especially in the theological um, papers most explicitly, but really in the, in the you know, practical papers as well, these issues are front and center, even if they weren't being quite so explicitly named as such. Two issues that are in the foreground are participation and mediation. There's also presence, of course, which has been raised in terms of real presence and the like, but that strikes me as a little less sticky and also maybe a little less universal issue of concern. Um, uh, 
there's not a whole lot of controversy among our panelists, for example, that um, digitally mediated presence as we are present to one another now, though asymmetrically, I should, I should note. I mean, we are present to you, uh, gathered audience, more than you are to us. We, we are aware of your existence, but um, our, our presence to one another is, is asymmetrical, which I think is, is worth thinking about, although I'm not gonna take that up. Um, in any case, there's little, there's little controversy, I think, among us that digitally mediated presence isn't less real than the presence of being in a room together. Um, and whatever the differences in, in our specific theologies of Eucharistic presence, the Eucharistic presence isn't limited to bread and wine shared tangibly. Um, and so too, the Holy Spirit should have little trouble at all being present among two or three gathered or assembled um, across great physical distances any more than the Spirit is able to be present in short distances. Um, so then what's the issue? And this is, you know, I think uh, Emilio brought this up early on, um, the sense of the, the issues at hand are human issues, not divine issues. Teresa Berger in, her, in Ad Worship makes this point as well, um, that where there are problems with encountering God in digital space, they're human problems, not divine problems. So, okay, let's look a little more closely at the um, human problems in terms of these two core issues that I see in, in the foreground of our conversation today. So what's participation? Um, we can talk about participation in worship, um, whether that's, uh, you know, as, as Emilio and as um, Christina noted, um, active participation versus what might be described as a passive participation, passively sort of consuming or taking in a, a live stream versus being actively participate, I mean, you know, in, in, a, in an offline setting, you might think of um, participants singing along with the hymns, um, responding to the responses of the people, but that's never exactly enough. I mean, I think we can all name uh, examples of offline in-person worship where people weren't entirely present. You yourself have not been entirely present at every offline worship. So simply being present isn't synonymous with, uh, with participation. Um, and the other kind of participation that was, that was a, a theme for conversation today was participation in um, divine self-impartation. In Greek, uh, this the sense of taking a part in what is mediated through, um, through the Eucharist or through the, the liturgy more broadly. So what's necessary for participation? Are eyeballs on the screen enough? Or are we talking also or primarily about a disposition of the heart? And if so, in what way is that at all different than the disposition of the heart that would either be there or not be there in offline worship? Um, then again, I mean, is, is participating in online worship, in what other ways is it different from an in-person liturgy? Um, we've been animated by questions like, to what extent and in what ways does the difference of digital mediation versus um, uh, the sort of physicality or the sensuality of um, being able to see one another, uh, to smell one another, to, to be in the physical proximity of um, human, human flesh, right? On the other hand, um, well, I'll, let, me, let me come back to incarnation because I want to touch on mediation first. So the, the, that's one kind of cluster of issues that has come up. Another cluster of issues is around mediation. And I think this may be more complicated, not just because it's at stake in online worship more obviously, because mediation is all the way, it suffuses in-person worship as well. Um, Christian worship has always been, not only Christian worship, has been mediated, multi-mediated as long as it has existed. But the specific ways that digital and online mediation affects the liturgical and interpersonal life of Christian communities has been another kind of core consideration for, for this conversation. What, what is mediation? Um, we could describe it as the linking of two unlike or apart things. Um, the establishment of an in-between where 
things or people at a remove from one another are brought together. So mediation is a, is a term of art in, um, in theology and not least in terms of um, in what way is divine presence mediated? Is it, is it immediate or is it present to us through sacramental elements of many different kinds? Um, so a telephone is a medium people, by which people can speak to each other from across the world. A book, for example, the Bible, is a medium by which people can transmit their understanding to remote recipients many centuries later. Um, mediation is everywhere in offline worship and music, in language, uh, being spoken and heard, in the bread and wine, etc. cetera. Um, but if we accept, and maybe we don't, but if we accept the famous axiom of Marshall McLuhan that the medium and that which is mediated are mutually inextricable, then we have to at least consider that the, that which is mediated in online worship is not identical to that which is mediated offline. That may not be a problem, but we haven't exactly touched on it in those terms. It's come up in a couple ways of some sort of intangible or almost mystical difference. And I'll come back to that in a few minutes, but um, I wanna bring that up in terms of mediation because I think it's a reminder that this is an ancient question as well, that you know, when, when we think about the creation of the iconographic tradition in the Christian East, that there's a question of, are our icons capable of mediating holiness in the same way that relics do? Which they're trying to, the effort is to offer icons as a sort of infinitely reproducible, far more convenient, but no less efficacious and no less edifying means of mediating the presence of God and the presence of the saints. Um, so those questions I think are very much with us today. I wanna to touch on one more thing for mediation before I, I move forward. Um, this question that came up, uh, somebody brought it up, I think Sam Wagner brought it up, um, the issue of remote mediation across time, not just across space. So this question about pre-recording, um, I did notice that there is a real difference of opinion about this, uh, that the idea of pre-recorded worship um, you know, might involve actually the people who are on the recording then participating in the chat at the time of the broadcast. And so there's a sort of a, a communal watch party, if you like, around the, the, the broadcast of a pre-recorded and pre-edited liturgy. To what extent is that valid? I mean, these are, these are questions that um, have not been resolved. Um, and yet, even for those of you, um, for example, I think both Emilio and Liza uh, expressed uneasiness with this, this kind of, um, this means of mediation. We haven't quite been able to articulate why digital mediation across time is more problematic than digital mediation across space. So I'd offer that, I think, back to you as a, as a, as a, as a question. Um, okay, let me move forward. Um, oh, the, the, actually, the last thing I would mention here is that we've seen a tension, um, very, a very strong tension between the, the generally accepted realness or authenticity of indeed the materiality, as Emilio put it, that it, computer screens and chips and, and wave particles are material. Um, so the, the realness of digitally mediated communion and yet the potentially detrimental dynamics of digital mediation, which do have to be addressed without ever mistaking those challenges as evidence that those challenges are somehow greater or more grave than the challenges of mediation and offline worship. Okay. Um, some puzzles uh, that we're left with at the end of this conversation. I think there are two ways to go about this. We could talk about pros and cons, taking a kind of evaluative approach to our conversation. We've learned a lot about what works and what is the benefit of the necessity that we find ourselves in. Um, there's a lot that we can take away uh, as we think about, you know, quote unquote, life after COVID, whatever this ends up meaning. Um, however, our civilization ends up being changed. But there is an opportunity, as Peter pointed out right at the beginning, to take stock of what really does need to be brought forward and what doesn't. So the pros are clear, I think. Um, accessibility for those um, who are not uh, physically or 
uh, emotionally, psychologically capable of gathering in, in person, accessibility is an enormous issue. Although we should also remember that internet accessibility, quality of internet is not, can't universally be uh, assumed. That being online is also an accessibility issue and is not uh, a guarantee that, be, that online streams, for example, are more accessible because of very slow internet speeds. Um, another advantage, real connectivity, not only in a time of isolation, like the midst of a, the deaths of a pandemic, but in general, I mean, connectivity across great distances with colleagues and friends and family um, who are not with us in our physical space. Um, Christina noted the connectivity of, of being able to worship in one's own language from abroad. I think that's extremely important. And likewise, at the, that's at the, the furthest geographical distance, at the smallest geographical distance, the connectivity within a family uh, over, over a liturgical, uh, sort of self-organized liturgical gathering, um, which may in fact be a greater sense of connectivity, spiritual connectivity than what's possible in a, in a community setting. So, and finally, um, new modes and opportunities for leadership, as well as recognition of leadership that's long been exercised. Here, I'm thinking again of, of Christina's presentation in particular, um, as well as new theological depth being dedicated to areas that have often gone underdeveloped, pneumato pneumatology, for example, or, or at least underappreciated uh, in many of our contexts. The cons, on the other hand, um, I think are more circumstantial and obviously not- We, we, have, a, we have about two minutes. Oh, goodness, okay. Um, that's fine. I'm still gonna talk about the cons because I think they're important. One, um, how do we think about the formation of the self via digital worship? Um, different media work on us differently. Liza brought this up and liturgy forms us differently. I think we need to still pay attention to that. There's a lot of, there's a considerable angst circulating in our culture around the corrosive effects of screens on our attention, our patience, our subjectivity, et cetera. That's also worth attending to. Um, and finally, the one that I think is most important um, is the, the risk, the ecumenical implications of the risk to our communal formation and our intercommunal formation. Uh, the risk of self-segregation and information bubbles, I think is very grave. Um, if, we're, if it's easier than ever and we're able and we do surf until we find exactly the liturgical environment that reflects our own preferences, where our existing views are affirmed and we're challenged as little as possible, um, then we are losing something that I haven't heard raised as one of the real merits of in-person gathering, precisely to be in the, the opportunity, I'm sorry, Emilio, but to be in the, in the presence and Eucharistic communion with people who disagree with us often very profoundly. And that loss is very, very dangerous. And I think it's worth considering as we go forward. I'll conclude because I know we're, we're very short on time, but um, let me just come to the, the end of what I had jotted down here. I, I agree completely with um, Father Lazarakis that the way forward is a both and um, way. Um, cherished offline assemblies, which, which will return in some way, but I, I do suspect that they will rarely be entirely offline. Um, as digital mediation gets ever more robust and high fidelity, I'm thinking, you know, Zoom in a couple of years is gonna seem like an uncanny valley when we have real um, virtual reality, so to speak, um, options. Uh, raising accessibility, lowering the ecological cost of travel, et cetera, even if it offers something vanishingly close to being face-to-face. -face. I, I think I would agree with Father, Father Lazarakis that even if this happens, the specialness and the holiness of face-to-face -face encounter will only be amplified by not being taken for granted. You know, holiness is risky. And we do indeed sometimes, as, as he puts it, breathe the same air. So if we come out of this time improved, and that's a big if, I trust that has to include a profound gratitude and appreciation for the face-to-face -face presence that we, that we get, not as the only legitimate means of interpersonal togetherness, um, liturgical or otherwise, but as an opportunity for joy and as an ever slightly more eschatological glimpse of God and each other. Thank you. Thank you.
As we conclude this webinar, I'd like to thank all participants. You were really here, really here. <laughs> but most especially, I thank our, our distinguished panelists. I, I thank again my colleagues in the Ecclesiological Investigations International Research Network who have worked hard to put this event together. Uh, we invite all of you to remain in touch by following our website and attending our panels at major conferences, publicity, the call for papers at the European Academy of Religion is still open. Uh, it will be in Münster, live or virtually. <laughs> um, I thank again our co-sponsor and host, jo Georgetown University's Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace and World Affairs, which will post a captioned video of this event on their site. Thanks again to our other co-sponsors, the Department of Theology and Religious Studies at Georgetown University and the North American Academy of Ecumenists. I conclude by wishing you all in advance a very happy Easter, now, whether that celebration comes this weekend or a few weeks down the road. Blessings and peace to you, and thank you for your digital attention and active participation. <laughs>